and of the several states shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. So that is the oath requirement in the Constitution itself. And as Jeff alluded to earlier, part of keeping that oath doesn't involve just those in the military, obviously. It's everybody else, including us lawyers. And like Jeff, I feel the same obligation, same reason why he served as an ACLU general lawyer, and my hat's off to him for doing so. I've also gone out of my way in pro bono cases to defend the Constitution to the best of my ability under my oath. Um, he alluded to also a change in, or a supposed change in the perception of the role of the Tenth Amendment. But I'd like to hearken back to something written by James Madison, who is rightly considered to be the father of the Constitution. It was his Virginia plan that became the heart and soul of the Constitution at the 18, 18, uh, 1787 Convention. Um, this is something he wrote in 1798. And he talks about the duty of the state legislature. He says, it is their duty to watch over and oppose every infraction of those principles of the Constitution, which constitute the only basis of that union. And he says, in particular, in case of a deliberate, palpable, and dangerous exercise of other powers not granted by the said compact, the states who are parties thereto have the right and are in duty bound, not just a right, but a duty, to interpose for arresting the progress of evil and for maintaining within their respective limits the authorities, rights, and liberties appertaining to them. He wrote this in the Virginia Resolution of 1798. It doesn't sound like an enunciation of the supposed province of local government or state powers. It sounds much more like an obligation and a duty to defend the Constitution of the United States, and in particular, the Bill of Rights. Marine General Smedley Butler, the very famous winner of two Medal of Honors, once said, there are only two things worth fighting for. One, defense of your homes. Two, defense of the Bill of Rights. That's it. He said, everything else is a sham. War is a racket. But he was still firm on that. Now, what was Madison objecting to and discussing in the Virginia Resolutions? It was the Alien Sedition Acts. Almost immediately, with the ink on the Constitution hardly even dry, and the First Amendment, almost immediately, a law was passed in the name of national security during the quasi-war with France that criminalized speech. And you had newspaper editors and reporters being arrested and thrown in prison simply for criticizing the president or his policies. Now, this is a law passed by Congress, signed into law by President John Adams, one of our great founding fathers. And do you think the federal courts stopped this? In fact, I just learned from Jeff earlier that, that uh, Chief Justice Chase directed juries that they must convict. So you had almost immediately a breakdown in the purpose of the Bill of Rights. The preamble of the Bill of Rights is not in your materials, unfortunately, but it says right there, to prevent misconstruction and abuse of these powers. That is what the Bill of Rights was for. But almost immediately, you had all three branches of the federal government directly violating the First Amendment. What do you do when that happens? What is your recourse? Simply elections? The answer of Madison and Jefferson both was no. The states have a duty. The people themselves, as we said earlier, are sovereign. And it is in their states they have a duty and an obligation to stand up and protect the people against such abuse. We are now in direct parallel. The Patriot Act and most recently the NDA of 2012 which contains direct provisions that allow military detention and trial of U.S. citizens is our modern day Alien Sedition Act. Every bit as violative of our rights as what they suffered back then and resisted against. What is our recourse now? They're passed with overwhelming majorities in Congress, a bipartisan assault on our Constitution and Bill of Rights. What do we do as people? The federal courts? Don't look to them to defend you. They will not. They have not yet. To the contrary, they've upheld it. 
in the Hamdi case, the most recent case, 2004, saying there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution that prevents the U.S. government from attaining one of its own citizens as an unlawful combatant. Directly flying in the face of Article 3, Section 2, it says the trial in all cases must be by jury, and Article 3, Section 3, which says that treason shall consist only in living war against the United States or aiding and abetting against enemies, and no person shall be convicted of treason except upon two witnesses to the overt act or open confession in open court. So, directly flying in the face of direct commands of the Constitution, they're saying we can go ahead and treat the rest of you, all Americans, the same as somebody in Iraq or Afghanistan, like a foreign enemy in wartime. What do we do in this circumstance? This is, to me, far more important a question than local rule in a county or a town or even in the state as far as drinking gauge, things like that. That certainly is important, and I think Nikki's going to talk maybe perhaps a little bit about medical marijuana. Another very good example here in Montana. The people of Montana decided they want to allow it, but what happened? The federal courts, the federal legislature have all said, we can do what we want to, despite your best wishes. We'll come in there and do it anyway. We'll criminalize. We'll wipe you out. You have Chris Lindsay, a Montana lawyer and provider, now facing 25 consecutive life sentences for something that was legal in Montana under Montana law passed by resolution by the Montana people. So, what do we do? And I'll follow up Stuart's ending with a question by starting with a question. State sovereignty, what has it done for me lately? As I was uh, thinking about our conversation today, I was focused mostly on, in my work as public policy director for the ACLU of Montana, uh, we are focused on uh, protecting, expanding, defending the individual liberties that are guaranteed to us by our state and federal constitutions. We represent clients all across the state of Montana in preserving those individual liberties and uh, usually what it means for us, state sovereignty means for us, is that our work has just doubled. We have to fight for those clients on two different fronts. Uh, often we have to defend against government encroachment on individual liberties uh, on the state level and on the federal level. But a more generous and optimistic view is that the shared governance between the state and federal governments provides us also with more of an opportunity to advance civil liberties. If we suffer a defeat on one front, we still have another front on which we're able to expand and preserve individual civil liberties. I'm going to take the five minutes that we each have to start off with just by outlining how I think Montana state sovereignty can help protect the liberties of each Montanan, but also what it can't do. There are some limitations in how we're able to use our, our dual system of state and federal government, how it can help. With respect to its own actions, its own policies and programs, and its own laws, the state sets its own bar for protecting individual liberties. Our state constitution sets a floor which is in many times higher than what the federal constitution requires of the state. The state can and does subject itself to a higher standard and it constrains itself to a larger degree than what the federal constitution requires. For example, you've already heard other panelists talk about the enumerated individual rights that our state constitution has, which our federal constitution does not. For example, our right to privacy, which is specifically enumerated in our state constitution, not explicitly enumerated in our federal constitution, and what that means for us here in Montana is that we do have a greater right to privacy within private spheres. We do have a greater rights in the area of reproductive freedom. Restrictions on access to abortion services that have been upheld in other states and that have been upheld under the federal constitution have been struck down here in Montana. The state has constrained itself within our own constitution and has 
made it off limits for the state to interfere in some areas where the federal constitution would say that's just fine for the state to regulate. A similar example which Chuck Johnson brought up during lunch in uh, our state's anti-sodomy law. The state of Montana's Supreme Court struck down the state's anti-sodomy law years before the United States Supreme Court came in and ruled that individual states' anti-sodomy laws were violative of the federal constitution. You also know that we have an explicit right to individual dignity, and another clause within that right is to equal protection. And within that right to equal protection, the state constitution enumerates several protected classes. It enumerates several bases upon which not just the state or a local government, but actually private actors are restricted from discriminating against an individual. Oh, I am already running out of time. <laughs> what we think that means for us in our work going forward, you, you may know that the ACLU of Montana currently represents six same-sex couples throughout the state of Montana. We are arguing that the state of Montana's right to individual dignity, right to privacy, and equal protection constrain the state when it decides to provide some benefits to some couples, but to deny them to same-sex couples like our plaintiffs. How else state sovereignty can help? The state can refuse to implement federal laws. The state can't be commandeered into carrying out federal policies that Montanans don't like. Some examples here in Montana where we have Montanans refusing to carry out federal policies, the real ID law that the federal government passed. In that instance, the federal government stated that if a Montanan an Alabaman, a Californian, wanted to use his or her state driver's license to board a plane or various other things, that that ID would now have to meet extra requirements. It was a burden on the state that they then were going to have to change their driver's license. Montana said no. Now, in many instances, the, what this, uh, this uh, concept means is that the federal government can't use a stick. It can't force the state to implement the laws that are passed by Congress. It can still use a lot of carrots, and I think that will be discussed as, as we move on. Um, but we, we've seen instances where Montan Montanans have said that uh, we don't want that carrot, and the federal government cannot force us to eat that carrot. Uh, but what state sovereignty can't do, state sovereignty is not magic pixie dust. We can't simply sprinkle it over federal laws that we don't like and suddenly render those federal laws invalid. While Montanans might not make something illegal in our state, we may not regulate it in our state, our authority to make those decisions in our state doesn't grant us the unilateral authority to make legal what the federal government has made illegal. For example, with medical marijuana laws, here in the state of Montana, it is legal uh, until the court rules otherwise and upholds uh, <laughs> Senate Bill 423. But it is, <laughs> it, is, uh, it is legal for some Montanans to be able to use medical marijuana. It is not a state crime. However, as we all know, it is definitely a federal crime. Federal law enforcement is enforcing those laws here in the state of Montana. Let's not conflate our love of wanting to be able to make